Hello, everybody. Um, so I want to thank Charlie, WCN, all the people that we, whom we listen to today, really warriors, and that's what it's taking these days. Charlie asked me to talk about rewilding. So that's what I'm going to talk about, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to take a little route to get there. And I'm going to show you a little video to kind of get it rolling, and then we'll go from there. said we're Tompkins Conservation. Um, we have teams in Chile and Argentina and here in the United States. And um, we've been at this for about 25 years. As I said, Charlie asked me if I would talk about rewilding, rewilding of species that have been extirpated in, this, in the areas that we concentrate on. And as I thought about this, uh, I was reminded of one of the big things we face is that 85% of human populations today are urban. And what has that done to us? It's distanced, as all of you know, from those things that are wild. It takes us away from our roots. It takes us away from the foundation upon which all of us ex exist. And the number of people who are every year moving into urban societies forget what it takes for true balance in our lives. So I want to talk about a wild mind, because I think a lot of people have lost that. And if you don't have a wild mind, then it's very difficult for you to eventually reconnect, not only to yourself, I believe, but also to those sentient beings who deserve to live in peace and evolve naturally throughout this planet. When you think about your mind, I think about my mind. I think about Einstein, who had no boundaries. He was a wild mind. Edward Abbey, another one. Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir standing when they dedicated Yosemite into a permanent protection. They had wild minds. And how did they manifest that? They manifested it by, by having the audacity to take something that is a masterpiece and set it aside for all time for everybody. It didn't matter what class you came from, what color was your skin, which state you arrived from. Those parks were your parks. That's a wild mind. And that's what we're missing. And if you're going to work, and you saw this in example after example today, from the people who are up here speaking, that's what it takes to do the work to create a rewilding, a situation for rewilding. 
I like this quote by the Dalai Lama mostly because it has restorers, storytellers, and lovers, and I love all those things. And the Dalai Lama gets it, of course, by the nature of him being himself. Pope Francis gets it. We cannot exist as individuals in terms of spirit, nor just basic life without all life. So, rewilding, what are the assumption of values? That all, all species have intrinsic value that has nothing to do with the value that we place upon it. This puma, <laughs> this puma cougar should be out there just evolving, eating things, having sex, sleeping under rocks, wherever they go, and know that that's their life. They deserve that life. We believe that all human communities should be dignified, that long-term human communities find the goodness in their place, and that all individuals are respected. How we look at the world, our place in it, that matters. How you, when you go out and you're taking photographs, and we've got some whopping photographers here today as an example, what, what does that mean to them? How do you use those photographs? What do you do when you go and visit a place and you think it's fabulous and you, you were climbing, you were boating, whatever you were doing, do, you do, do we do something to protect those very things that we love? How you see the world? How do you, how do you entrust yourself with the responsibility of being part of that? For my husband Doug and me, beauty was essential. Beauty as a value, that if you don't have beauty in your life, whether it's how the soap is in your bathroom all the way through to a landscape that's intact, the, the description of beauty is really endless. But that's a big value of ours. Going forward to our ancestors, nobody ever understands what I mean by this when I talk about it. So I'm going to explain it like this. For 25 years, people have said to Doug and me, oh, do you want to just go back to the cave? Is that what we're talking about here? You want to roll back progress? So we have, for many, many years, questioning this idea of progress. Why is progress always good? What is progress? Where does it lead you? Right now, I think, we think, it's leading you off the cliff. So, to counter the, the attack that we want to go back to the cave, think about this. You're walking along. I can do it here. I'm walking up to this tape. They told me not to go past this tape. This is progress. This is human progress. I'm coming up to the edge of the stage. I take one more step. I'm in this guy's lap. But what happens if I turn around and I take a step forward? Which way am I going? We can go ahead and think that there, are, that there is no limit to growth, that we can all do and live as we choose. Or we can turn around and start walking the other way, and it's progress. But you're going the right way. I don't know if I explained this very well, but I have it very clear in my head <laughs> that the ancestors... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so go forward to the ancestors. Were they connected? They were connected. Did they understand the relationship to fire, to forest, to fire, to grasslands? They did. What knocked them out? Usually, we Europeans. So these are things to think about. When you're thinking about rewilding, are you thinking about it in its full sense of rewilding ourselves? First, think about the loss of community and culture. And you heard a lot about this today from various people, whether they were smaller communities in, in various African countries and so on. The loss of community, the lack of the knitted togetherness is one of the great fractures of our time. 
And I think everybody in this room knows this, but just on the off chance that you hadn't thought about it, you cannot rewild, you cannot have full-bodied conservation unless you have communities that are knitted together and see the value of conservation and fully-fledged wildlife as their neighbors. Because long-term, it ain't going to happen unless you get it. So thinking about the importance of dignified communities that are, that are honored and, and um, key to the long-term conservation 100, 200 years from now, if you don't have that, you can kiss off any conservation areas that you're working on. So I like this picture because I think that's nature over there, just about to be eaten by the globalized economy. <laughs> so, this is what's happening, and that's just about, the size is about right. That's the fight we're in, and I believe it's a fight, I'm sad to say. We are at odds with nature. So in our case, we asked, my husband was the founder of North Face, and he sold that, started a spree, sold that. I was the, uh, what was I, CEO of Patagonia. I was there for 24 years. And in 1993, we decided to leave, retire, and, and head out to Chile and, and Argentina and begin to figure out ways to protect those things we love, those things we identify with. We were both old ski racers, climbers, boaters, etc. So, in the ensuing 25 years, and what we're probably traditionally more well known for is we bought up, as, as Charlie said, just under two and a half million acres, but we leveraged it into all these national parks and we're headed toward 15 million acres. Um, as he said, I'm trying to sign this last thing with the Chilean government for a 10 million acre hit and create all of these new national parks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, well and good. I agree. That makes me happy. I'm a results girl. First one we ever worked on, uh, Pumaline Park. This is where we had the bejesus kicked out of us from 1992 forward. We were, the known as, we were known as the couple who cut Chile in half. Uh, this is a million acres worth of pristine, temperate rainforest. We were accused of starting a new Jewish state, even though we were raised Anglican, a new, uh, what do you call it? nuclear waste dump for the United States, and the real corker was we want to take out all the cattle in southern Chile and move in the American bison. So that's, that's how we cut our teeth on conservation. Uh, the new Patagonia National Park that we're signing now, just under 800,000 acres, and Iberá National Park, which is in the northeastern section of Argentina, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. This is uh, new landscape for us when we first started in 1997. Flat, subtropical, first time I flew in there, I, could, I thought, let's get back on that Cessna and let's get out of here. It's hot, it's bugs, I'm done. But Doug saw something, and he was right too. He saw a gold mine of biodiversity, and that's what we're going to talk about as my example of rewilding. Our years, our early years, were filled with thousands of hours of flying in our 206 or the Husky, and this is how we began to understand the lay of the land. This is how we really began to understand what we were doing and what we could do, because we have always been in very isolated places and on the Chile side, extreme landscapes, hard flying. Those are hard flying hours. Uh, we were always involved in political fights. This is a campaign that we were very uh, central to, which was stopping dams in southern Chile. And this is 88,000 people in Argent uh, Santiago, Chile. And we won that fight. And not, not we, the Tompkins, 
but everybody involved in this, and this was David and Goliath, and we beat those guys back. And that's the kind of stuff that you get involved in when you're trying to do conservation. <laughs> Then, of course, fires, God knows. We've been through it all. And living in isolated places in all these parks are very isolated by, well, not by some of your standards, because we're all, a lot of us are working in large landscapes. But the simplest ta task is multiplied by 100. And I'm, I know that many of you are working like this. So through the early years, we were focused on politics and surviving and building teams and so on. And uh, working with the president of Chile last March on this 10 million acre deal we're finishing up now. But it really, we were not focused, and on the Chile side didn't need to be focused on rewilding because there wasn't much missing. But in Ibera, northeastern Argentina, subtropical savanna wetlands. Think of the Pantanal, but about a quarter of the size, half the size, a third of the size. It was beautiful. That we got right. But we really began to understand, the longer we were there, that there were so many things missing. And as our good friend Wendell Berry says, you can't have beauty unless you have the whole horse. And he was right about that then, and he's more right about that than ever now. So what was there? Marsh deer were there. Sounds good. Too few of them, but they were there. Lots of carpinchos, and we'll get back to that. No predator to take them down. That population went off the charts. Lots of greater reyes <clears throat> coming in the back door, frankly. Storks of all s sorts. Howler monkeys. So who's gone missing? We didn't understand this. And it was like an epiphany in a certain kind of way. And it changed the, the landscape, the, the essence of our work utterly. We went from being activists and land concert park builders to serious players in the rewilding field. We have, this is uh, marsh deer coming in. We have extraordinary teams uh, building the architecture to look at all the species within the Iwara watershed and who's missing. And we started one by one, and we started with the giant anteater. And today we have almost 120 living free, reprodu reproducing in the wild. That species is back as an example. Jaguars, we're working on jaguars. That's a whole nother story, but of course, if you don't get the top predator back, you're in nowheresville. So when we started rewilding there, we had to commit to what is a very expensive and very long-term project of bringing the jaguars back. And why can we do it? because we have almost 1.7 million acres of no conflict zone, which almost just doesn't exist in most places. So you have the opportunity to do it, and when you have the opportunity, you go for it. This guy, tapirs, they've been gone for 70 years. They're back. And this little guy was born four months ago, and I can't help it. <laughs> I cannot help myself. <laughs> This is where we have been based every winter, our winter, since we started in 1997, and he was the rock star this winter. I have hundreds of pictures of this guy. He's, a, he's so spoiled. He's wild. He's the first one born in the wild in Ibera in 70 years. His name is Arandu. <laughs> and he's, he's intolerable. <laughs> um, Pampas deer, very heavily endangered species in Argentina, two million of them as a steady population many, many decades ago, and now it's down to below 2,000. And we have brought them back to Ibera, 
and they are reproducing very well. We have two, so three generations there already. Now, these are white-collared peccaries. Nobody thinks about them much, but if you're going to rewild, you gotta bring everybody back. And they turned out to be the nastiest of all of them. When you're out walking, these are the guys you have to watch out for. <laughs> so, this is a special story. These are green-shouldered macaws. They have not been in Argentina for 200 years. So this was a long shot, but we did know that there were individuals that we could acquire. But how do, you, how do you bring birds in who don't even know how to fly? They've been captive, they're in zoos, they're in private collections. So against my better judgment, we decided to go for it and see if we could bring this population back and get it started. So this is how they, this is how, first of all, they're, they're as nasty as I am. And this is how they started. They were in giant cages, just bickering and eating. That's what they did. And today, I'm very proud to say we have birds flying, and <laughs> the first ones in a couple hundred years. There's a whole lot of story behind this, but I don't have time. But this is extraordinary. And then some little guys, the little honey eater. Um, it's extraordinary when you see these individuals start to come back. There are no words for this. It's just an honor to be participating in this. Down in Patagonia, go 4,000 clicks to the south, kilometers to the south. Rewilding. The Wanakos were there, but over the last 100 years of grazing, they've been marginalized. They've almost become browsers at this point. All the bottom valleys were taken and fenced off for sheep or in the really nice grasses for cattle. So we've taken out almost 500 miles of fence line and these guys get to go wherever they want to in the Patagonia National Park, which is 760,000 acres. <laughs> the mountain Viscacha, he was there, she was there but very, very few, because where you have livestock, you have dogs. So you take the livestock off, which we have done. When we bought the first 200,000 acres, we had to buy 25,000 sheep with it, and it was August, so it's lambing season, so in six weeks we had 50,000 sheep <laughs> and 4,000 head of cattle. That's another long story, I won't go into it, but suffice to say, that eventually the livestock goes off and species who were there but ill-represented come back. The story everywhere, what happens with predators. We heard a lot about African lions today and personally, I, you know, I think all of us find this, there are no words for it, what's happening. In Chile and Argentina, the cats, <clears throat> pumas and foxes are quite persecuted very systematically. There's a quota system. If, you, if I show you my skins of predators I've shot, I get money from the province. So you have 80 years of a very suppressed predator population. When we started out, we took the lid off this. No more hunting of pumas. Well, what has happened is now we have, we're considered to be a puma factory. Now that's not funny because neighboring ranches, when they call you that, then you know you have problems with your, your neighbors. But the pu puma population is coming back really nicely. But what happened with that? We have the largest population of waymul deer, a deer that looks like a mule deer to most of you, but, there are only 1,700 of them left between Chile and Argentina. So now you have a rising puma population and 
you're worried about the very thing that you're trying to protect, the waymole deer. That's a whole nother story. But that's what rewilding, restoration <laughs> requires. And, and uh, it's never dull. Another, another species, highly persecuted over the last 80 years, coming back, and uh, you see them everywhere now. I'm very proud about this beautiful, um, quirky mammal. Low population base of lesser rheas, not to be confused with the one you saw earlier in Ibera, which is the greater rhea. Population very low, used for meat. Again, where you have livestock, you have dogs. Where you have dogs, you have predation on the adults and juveniles themselves, or you've got lots of people looking for eggs to have a sandwich. So we have a big project rebuilding communities of, these, of this species um, in two big areas in Patagonia. So why is everybody working on this? Why are all these stories you've heard today so relevant? Because we're all trying to change the story. Because you can imagine a world where humans have dignified lives, but we are also living among the beauty and the pride, elegance, and rightful place of the non-human world. So what we want to do is we want to change the end of the story. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> So, one of the baby anteaters, every time we see a new one, it's like the first. Now we've seen 50 some of them, but it's always the first. Because that little guy, he takes a step out onto those grasslands he can't even walk through because he's too small. And you know, even if he doesn't survive long term, he will have had the shot that his ancestors had. And they haven't had that in a really long time. And this guy, <laughs> little fatty, <laughs> large predators. We should hold, I don't care what our religions are or aren't, we should hold a wild mass every day. I'm serious. That we find a way to protect these beautiful, gorgeous creatures from our predation and fear. Finally, Finally, it comes down to this for me. You have to have vision. And my husband, Doug, had vision that was so extraordinary. And I don't say that because he was or is my husband. I say it because he saw these things. He saw protecting vast masterpieces of, some, of countries. He saw the possibility of Ibera. He saw the possibility of rewilding and what it would take. And I am forever grateful for that. And I think I will leave you with this. It's our honor in a certain kind of way and job to get up every day and do something for those things you love for those things that hold meaning, not just for yourself, but I mean the big you, the wild mind you. As Edward Abbey, the iconic writer, uh, said years ago, sentiment without action is the ruination of the soul. And I believe that. So. I think we would all agree, finally, 
that it comes down to this. <laughs> In all of our work, whether it's land or species, this is what matters. No grit, no peril. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.